Nashville, Tennessee, it's time for another episode of Tips, Tactics, and Tools for a Safer Tomorrow, where all things related to your safety and security are discussed, detailed, and delivered to you. You may leave with a tip that saves you money or a tactic that saves your life. So here are your hosts, owner and founder of Defend Systems, Brent Fiddler, and owner and operator of Herring Technology, Tom Herring. All right, everybody, welcome to this edition of Tips, Tactics, and Tools for a Safer Tomorrow. Bring it Tom here as usual. Uh, however, the location is not usual. We are podcasting remotely from the fabulous Royal Range USA in Nashville, Tennessee. It is a premier firearms training facility, retail store, gun range, you name it. Awesome place here. And we are happy to have with us John Harris, who's the executive director of Tennessee Firearms Association and also a fabulous practicing attorney should you need one. Hopefully you don't, but if you do, call John, right? That's right. <laughs> Is that a good slogan? Hopefully that, you never need me, but if you do, call me. Well, you know, I do a lot of NFA trust, so yeah, there, there you plenty go. of reasons you call even if you don't that's get true. in trouble with Yeah, the yeah call. that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, John, being Executive Director of Tennessee Firearms Association, let's start there. Explain to folks what it is TFA is and what you guys do. We formed uh, TFA in 1995. And the reason was, in 1994, Tennessee passed its first shall-issue law. Up until that time, if you wanted to carry, you basically had to get a, a law enforcement officer's commission of some sort, usually a deputy sheriff's commission, but that's how you carried prior to 94. And the, they passed that law, and it was only about a paragraph. Okay. And so it, w- it really didn't address a whole lot of problems that we had in Tennessee that had to do with once you got the permit, and the process wasn't very good. It we took two years to fix the process. But once you got the permit, where you could go, when you could use it, what constituted use of civilian deadly force, when was it justified, all these thou shalt nots that had to do with carrying in parks, going to work, restaurants, all of that. So TFA was formed uh, to focus on those kinds of issues. And unfortunately, we formed it because we realized within that first year that the NRA was coming in with sort of cookie-cutter bills that they wanted to pass in all the states, but they didn't want to run detail-oriented bills that reflected in-state case law, in-state nuances that weren't applicable in the other 49 states. Okay. So we've been around for a quarter century now. Wow. And we're a nonprofit corporation. We're a 501c4, which means we're not a charity, but we're tax exempt. Okay. And because we're not a charity, we can engage in issue advocacy and we can support candidates for public office and we can attack candidates for public office if we need to get rid of them. Yeah. Well, and the biggest thing for me, I, how I came to meet you guys was, of course, through Steve Cole, who's a mutual friend. And I ended up speaking at a TFA meeting, oh, guys, well, forever ago now. But I didn't realize until you got up and spoke about the the current legislative issues and all that stuff about how engaged you all were in that process. I mean, it makes sense. You're Tennessee Firearms Association. You're not just a gun club. No, no. We we track, on average, about 150 bills every two years. Yeah. Tennessee's passing anywhere from 5 to 20 new bills every year that impact gun owners in some shape, form, or fashion. Yeah. And we, we detail report on that stuff. And, and you go to our website, and you can get the, the uh, legislative report that came out this year. It'll tell you the seven bills that passed and what they do. Are they good? Are they bad? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's the detail that the NRA doesn't give the members. Well, and, so, and, and because of, of how deep a dive NRA has to take in each state to do that, right? They would have, I mean, the time, resources, energy. They right? just don't do it. I mean, yeah. our, the NRA lobby, I've, you know, I've known every lobbyist the NRA's had for the last quarter century, and they typically have Tennessee and maybe four or five other states. So we got a part-time lobbyist doing a full-time job, and they right. can't do it good. Right. That's for sure. So... Um, Let's talk about the legisl- the most recent one, because there, there's pretty significant stuff that happened, right? Yeah, there was until COVID. We were yep. on track to do some pretty substantial stuff. Yeah, which is uh, it's just been shelved now, but do you think still has steam or what? what? No, the Tennessee legislature operates on a two-year session, and so 2020 was the end of a two-year cycle. Yep. We get an election in November. Uh, we start a new two-year cycle in January, and all the bills in the last two years that didn't pass – are in the trash, we start over. 
Will they look similar, I assume? I mean, it won't work. Some will, some won't. I, I, an example is we had three bills on constitutional carry. The yep. worst of the three was the one the governor wanted. And, uh, and, and now, as a result of COVID and the shutdowns and a lot of discussion that's taken place, the legislators that even were behind that bill have come back to us and said, hey, TFA, you were right. We really want the bill in Tennessee that you were sponsoring because it's it's a better approach to get us to constitutional carry with an optional permit for reciprocity purposes. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, you know, um, when it was on track for that, people would ask me, like, well, why would I get my permit? I'm like, well, if you want to travel out of state, you know, I mean, Tennessee, it would just allow you to carry in Tennessee. Well, yeah, and, and another big reason with what was being run and pushed by the governor as well as, the NRA's lobbyists who coincidentally happened to at the first of the year have been on the governor's staff. He worked for the governor and then he became the NRA's guy in house is if you, if you, if it had passed and you'd gone to constitutional carry, we've got all these exceptions in the law, like being able to store it in your trunk at work or take it onto school grounds, parking lots and store it in the vehicle or carry in a park. Even none of that would have applied to those who were doing permitless carry had the governor's bill passed. So you would have had about four tiers of people that could carry legally in the state, and they could, some of them would, for example, be exempt from felony charges on school grounds where the guy that was doing the governor's constitutional carry could be charged with a Class E felony. So did did anybody ever explain to you why? I mean, what it seems like we all need to be, following the same rules regardless of what law you're carrying under right we should we absolutely should uh the why was the governor's bill was really a 17 million dollar crime package that had as an add-on constitution what he called constitutional carry okay and it, it was really it wasn't even that truly because it was really a, a, a defense to a criminal charge and you were in law enforcement so you know what defenses are yes sir it was a defense to a criminal charge and it only applied to those citizens who could meet the standards for getting the enhanced permit. And not every gun owner can meet the enhanced permit standards because they could have a DUI, for example, and disqualify them. Right. Okay. Well, it's, I mean, it, it's, I'm, I, I think constitutional carry is, um, you know, especially if you're a firearms guy, I mean, yeah, great, right? I mean, we're, well, yeah, we're I mean, looking 18, back to the Second Amendment, right? 18 states have it. Four states that touch Tennessee have it. Matter of fact, seven of the eight that touch Tennessee have permitless open carry. Yeah. Uh, the only one that's, uh, uh, that's hanging out there is Georgia. You know, you see where it's going now. Right. Uh, well, and you, you have this situation where – Especially in Tennessee, and Tom and I talked about this in previous episodes, we, we kind of dive dove off into the castle doctrine a little bit, and I want to go there with you, <laughs> right? But but um, you can carry in your car, right? You, you, with with no permit, whatever, you can drive around with a firearm and your weapon in your vehicle, no problem at all. Well, how is that a, a, a big difference maker if all of a sudden you now – putting it in a holster to walk into walmart i mean it shouldn't be at all i mean i I don't see a huge difference with it the only thing i i I don't like about i don't want to say that the only thing that concerns me a little bit is the thug that hadn't caught their felony yet right Right. now now they can drive around with it in their car too until they catch their first felony and so the retired law enforcement may go but well they're carrying with it anyhow exactly (laughs) no law is well yeah that's yeah, if, if anybody were ever on the fence, right? And it's not, it's not, not those guys, right? No, no. Uh, but what I find is, and what I found in law enforcement is, especially you pull over a carry permit holder, like, Tom, what do you what do you think you're supposed to do when you get pulled over by the police and you have a carry permit and a gun? What do you, what do you, what do you think a lot of instructors tell people? Hand them your driver's license and your permit card. Right. And, I, you know... For me, I didn't care one way or the other if you had your, I mean, and, and a lot of people would hand me their permit. I'm like, great, brother. You know, like, I'm glad more good guys with guns. I'll be right back with you. I'm like, I don't, I mean, and most law enforcement have that approach, right? They they think more good guys with guns is a good thing. I mean, that's, that's you know, I, I had, I won't say where, I, but I had one employee of one client space that sent me like a really long email after I did my presentation about <laughs> how, she disagreed with the fact that the only really effective thing at stopping a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And she wrote me like this diatribe yeah. about it. And like, I didn't even respond because I'm not, I'm just not going to go there. Right. But 
Um, most officers feel that way. So as a result, that bill and, and, and whatever comes out in the future as far as constitutional carry goes, ultimately is going to have the biggest result it's going to have is more good guys with guns are out and about. And, you know, you, you've seen some of these crazy people acting a fool that he and I have talked about and all the stuff that's going on now. And what has put a stop to a lot of it real quick? It's called, you know, a bullet or that's three. Right. Or so 12. often the officers there just in time to write the report, they don't stop many shootings. No. Well, and, <laughs> and yes, and that's unfortunate, but it's, it's the truth of reality. It's not what they want either. Right. You know, no. they would love to be able to. They're just not there when it happens. No, the, the, but the bad guys don't call and say, I'm about to. Yeah, correct. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And hey, you, did y'all see where I'm going next? Yeah. Now, if you're on their phones doing wires, then yes, you knew ahead of time, but that was a different brain, life. And that brain. was, a, yeah. Listen, we knew, but we had to go petition judges to, st- to get permission to listen to a, a plan of a murder because it wasn't, it didn't fall under the statute we applied for our, our warrant on, right? For, yeah. To, to listen to the phones. So every once in a while, even doing wires, lawful wiretaps, Tom, no sneaky stuff here. We went to a judge. During presidential we, campaigns. We would, or, <laughs> no. That wasn't us, bro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've tapped a lot of phones, but that one wasn't us. Um, but you're right. They, they, the good guys don't typically announce when they're – our bad guys don't typically announce when they're going to go do something. And, you know, as a result, they're, of course, during non-COVID times. That's how I have a company doing active shooter mitigation training for businesses and schools and corporations because the, the reality is the cops are not going to be there. And even when there's a whole bunch of them there, like in Las Vegas, it's still chaos, confusion. There's too many reasons that somebody else needs to be able to solve the problem and then or fix themselves or somebody else medically. I mean, right. that's, you know, why I focus on, on both. But... Let's let's. Uh, I'd like to dive into the Castle, Doc- Castle Doctrine a little bit. We we did. Oh, I don't know. I'm several episodes ago now because I had I was actually here teaching a private carry permit course, and you know I have to cover that in that course, and uh, especially how it extends to your vehicle and what I used. Um, you know, the t- Department of Safety has certain videos that they made that they like you to use, and that's fine. But I pulled some of the riot videos, right, and and had a serious conversation with my students about. At what point in this video could you have pulled the trigger? You know, like, yeah. um, and it's very um, obviously uh, important to talk about that stuff right now because some people see a video and go, ah, I shot that dude. And I'm like, just because he has a crowbar and he's at your driver's side window does not mean he has penetrated your driver's side window, right? I mean, and of course. And the, I guess the, how quickly I respond and the number of rounds I put down range for most people are going to are gonna change depending on whether or not my family's with me. You know, I may tolerate a little more, even though I don't have to by law. I may tolerate a little more if I'm by myself. But I think most people that are with their families and understand the law are probably not going to stand for it. So it, explain to people, so this is the attorney in him, he was he was actually on. He caught which yeah you you they asked for you to call in to Phil Valentine the other yeah. day right yeah so I was listening and Phil was talking about wait a minute so if somebody's standing outside my house with a Molotov cocktail in their hand getting ready to throw it at my house can I shoot them and I'm like mm, thinking no you can't <laughs> that's right and John called in and said well no uh, you can't because there's no there's no imminent fear. There's no, there's no imminent threat of serious bodily injury or death. Can they catch your house on fire? Yes. Do you have time to get out, though? Yeah. Of course, my answer is go out and confront them in the rear yard, get within throwing range of them, and if they rear back, then you can light them up, and then you're good. I mean, then that is imminent. You know. That takes a special kind of person. That, yeah. <laughs> special. I've been called way worse. Yeah. <laughs> Brink is that person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't change what I know, boys. I'm sorry, but... But let's talk about the, what is – explain the Castle Doctrine to folks and then talk about how uh, it applies at home, vehicle, and then business, right? I mean, it's, Well, and, and let me back into it from the self-defense statute because it's part of our self-defense statute. Yeah, okay. okay? So the self-defense statute in Tennessee is 3911-611. And it says if you're in a situation where there's imminent fear of death or serious bodily injury – those are defined statutory terms, so it doesn't necessarily mean what it, you think it means in Webster's. Right. But if you're in a situation where there's imminent fear of death or serious bodily injury, you have 
the right to use deadly force to protect human life, yours or someone else near you. Um, There are some exceptions to that rule that have to do with when is there a duty to retreat. The general statute used to be, prior to 89, you had to retreat in all circumstances if you could safely do it before you could use deadly force. Now our statute says you don't have to retreat if you're in a place where you have a right to be and you're not engaged in any illegal activity. The problem with the illegal activity clause, we just had a court of appeals decision on this come down and say, the illegal activity doesn't have to be related to why there was an assault or an attack on your life. So if you're at home and you're engaged in uh, a zoning violation because you didn't pull a permit to rewire your bathroom, that's technically illegal. Sure. And you would have to retreat in that situation, whereas if you pulled the zoning permit you wouldn't well that makes no sense to most people right and most people aren't going to think of the illegal activity standard because they've heard so much even on those department of safety videos that you don't have to retreat what that's not tennessee law so the castle doctrine is is technically a legal presumption that applies in the defense of a criminal case in tennessee that's why you it's really a long way to get to it yeah And what it says is, is if you're in a place where you have a right to be, it used to be just your home, but they've expanded it to a business, a hotel room, your car, a tent, an RV. If you've got a right to be there and you're not engaged in illegal activity, then the law presumes imminent fear of death or serious bodily harm if the person forcibly and feloniously enters the property more problems what do you do with the guy in the rural district that leaves his door unlocked and there's no forcible entry he just walked in the back door you know but that's that's the castle doctrine it's nothing but a legal presumption an evidentiary burden issue at trial so it's not something that necessarily keeps you from being charged oh no Mm -hmm. you know it can depending on officer's discretion or da discretion But it's not an absolute. You don't get to wave it in their face if you think they shouldn't have charged you. Sure. And so that's what we run into in Tennessee with the Castle Doctrine is for most people, if it ever is going to apply, it's either officer discretion, DA discretion, or you're going to have to carry that issue in front of a jury and let them decide, which means you're going to have to incur all the inconvenience, burden, and cost of a criminal trial. Sure. Yeah, it's going to be on you, and that and that varies. That can obviously vary with each officer. It can certainly vary with each department, and it absolutely varies with each jurisdiction. I mean, they're, they're very much. I mean, very obviously, we have a police officer in national charge of shooting somebody with a gun in their hand. So, you know, um, it, all that's. So I, I don't like for people to think of it as a blanket to. Well, I'm a, I'm good no matter what, and and that's why I'm glad you explained it in a lot better detail than I can, because. There are so many people that, that just assume, well, if I'm in my car and then they rip the door open, I'm smoking them. Well, okay. If you're in your car and your tags are expired or you don't have insurance, right. you've got a duty to retreat if you can. Right. Well, and, and of course, I showed in some of those videos the ones where it's always better. If you can, if you, if you can avoid the engagement, then obviously do, right? Because... You know, especially if they're shooting too. I mean, you know, we don't want to have to fix ourselves with a tourniquet or, God forbid, one of our family members. But there are instances, especially in some of the ones engaged in, in the in the traffic. You know, when there's just a flash mob on the interstate, where you're stuck. I mean, these people have nowhere to go. Right. And dude coming up and kicking your door is that intimidating? Sure. Can you smoke him? No. But then some of them started taking metal pipes to the driver's side window. Well, now it's a, obviously an aggravated assault coming at your head, breaching your vehicle. That's a different. That's a whole different animal, and you got nowhere to go. Yeah, it's a continuum. Yeah, though it's not an absolute, absolute on or off. It's a continuum. Right. But I have to oh. pause for a minute and check my registration and everything in my car from yeah. what I'm hearing. Yeah. And and you know, and we tell the legislators that he said, guys, you know, you don't need this unlawful activity thing. It ought to be based solely on, you know, uh, were you placed in a scenario where you were forced to defend your life now, then, well why wouldn't they just change it to, to criminal activity instead of illegal activity or or um 
right criminal co- like I, I know what their intent is. Or, i say i know what their intent is some of their intent would be well this is not going to apply to some dope deal gone bad we're not going to let that right i mean that I, well that's sort of what they were trying to get at is that someone engaged in criminal activity you know a drug dealer yeah but even in the drug dealer case, I mean, I, you could try that case and, and successfully raise the self-defense issue if the drug dealer, you know, tried to, because it, the, the criminal activity element has to do with whether or not there's a duty to retreat. Yeah. So the drug dealer that gets involved in a self-defense scenario that's engaged in illegal activity and attempts to retreat and can't and turns and shoots, he gets the self-defense charge. Well, I guess, but the, the, but the whole intent behind it is the same reason we have felony murder right i right. mean it's the same concept and same what they're trying to achieve they don't they don't want to pass along any extra protection to criminals right and i'm 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 there but you're right it it especially a rogue cop rogue da somewhere that, that, that you have something they and i found especially after doing wires um <laughs> there's a lot of dirty stuff that goes on in this state um and there's a lot of dirtiness in politics and if you know the da in putnam county doesn't like joe blow and that happens and they didn't pull a permit they will prosecute your butt just because they don't like you i mean absolutely and, i see it all the time yeah well yeah i mean you're an attorney right i mean i'm sure there's there's tons of stuff but um what do you consider tennessee firearms association I mean, I realize you're a not-for-profit, but if you could sum up to what what you all attempt to do, uh, what your goal is, or your um, what do they call it? Not your slogan. What's the thing when you file your stuff? You got oh yeah yeah we're, we're the, the only the Emission state's only state. no compromise gun rights organization. Okay, yeah. I mean, you believe in this, the Second Amendment was created for for what it says exactly. Okay. You it know, is, it's it, in writing. It is. It's been there well, it for a little while. And, you know, and, 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 and the fact is, most people don't understand necessarily that there are two Tennessee Supreme Court decisions. that And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and they've been cited by the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and essentially what those two say, one's called Amet and the other's called Andrews from the 1800s, is that the constitutional right in Tennessee and the Second Amendment specifically protects not just the ability to own weapons, but expressly the, the ability to own weapons suitable for military engagement. So it goes far beyond just the, you know, the self-defense, everyday carry stuff. It, it gets into what we've got on the wall behind us. And, and if you fully applied it the way the Supreme Court did up until about 1940, that's the stuff that you wouldn't have to have a permit to own or carry. And uh, we're a long way from that. A long way. Well, I mean, I mean, obviously, the, the, maybe there's a lot of people that want to argue about that, but the the the, the, the what people fail to remember is what what the founding fathers had just experienced, right? I mean, mm-hmm. they, 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 their fear was the government. I mean, that that it was absolutely the government, exactly, and and overreach and all these things, and and how how do these communist nations end up? Yeah, you know, how does communism end up taking over in these nations? What do they do first? They go after the guns first. First. Well, that's first. what Lexington and Concord was all about, was they were coming for the guns and the privately owned cannon. They weren't coming in to register them to vote. You know, they were coming after their weapons, their munitions, and their ability. And it was the stuff that they would use, that they would muster with as local militia. Yeah. They wanted the military-grade stuff that, that would be used against the Redcoats yep. if they came in. And, and that's what the Second Amendment's all about. I mean, there's no doubt, if you read the first 150 years of cases, that it's all about military-quality weapons. Yeah, but apparently that stuff doesn't matter anymore because people like to rewrite history and talk about that, no, that's, that's protecting your right to hunt. Um, yeah, the 30 idiots that show up at my front door, all 30 of them, that's, yeah, my 30-round mag. Yeah, what? ask the couple in St. Louis about, about it right about now. Yeah, that's right. Well, you were what about happened? to ask about what? What, what the, the couple in St. Louis, there was a, a notion of... I guess they're being uh, prosecuted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What happened with that? I mean, is, what's the update on that? Does anybody know? Or they well, just passed the indictment stage, and and I can tell you this: in my opinion, if if they, we've we've you know most of your listeners have probably seen pictures or even video clips of what oh, yeah. happened with that couple in St. Louis. Yeah, had they done that in Tennessee under what is shown on those videos, they would be indicted here for ag assault. Really? They'd be indicted here for felony charges. The couple you, or the uh, the people that... Breached? No, 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 the, the couple. Okay. Because you cannot, under Tennessee statutes, use deadly force 
to prevent a trespass, to prevent theft or uh, destruction of personal property, or to make a citizen's arrest. What about, you know, so some of the people in the crowd were screaming, they're going to come in and I'm going to rape your wife and like that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, but they're 30, 40 feet away. And so if you remember the training we get in the videos from the state, they've got to have not just the threat made, but it's got to be the the credible ability ability to implement it. We used to call it the 21-foot rule in law enforcement. Yeah. Because you can can run 21 feet and stab me before I can unholster and shoot you. Mm -hmm. So you gotta, if you're across the parking lot with your knife, I can't just smoke you because I feel like, you, oh, we had a knife, right? Same thing. I don't have any problem with them coming out armed. I think and you may or may not agree. I think you'll agree from the law's perspective. The minute you go from this to this. When they brandished it, it's when they crossed the line. Well, I think, really? yeah, I think you could brandish without pointing it at them, right? I think you could. I think you could come out armed, could you not? I mean, there's, You could there's, come out armed. Brandishment is actually the use of the weapon to, to commit what we used to call an, a, a battery, a not okay. battery, an assault, where you communicate that you're intending to use it. Got it. So when they're pointing it at them and she's holding it in that sort of weird way she did. <laughs> and waving it around yeah. behind her husband's head. Yeah. I'm like, please don't have an AD right now. Yeah. That'd look really bad. You know, if, it, if it was holstered or if they were just sort of holding it in a low ready, but they've yeah. not gone to the brandishment level, then that's where they hit the problem if they've been in Tennessee. Well, that's where I misunderstood the word brandish. I, I always understood the word brandish to show. Show it. Right, yeah, but it's not. But brandishing it's not a, a weapon is not showing it. It's showing it. And with the intent to use yeah. it in a threatening mm-hmm. manner. It's it's communicating a threat. Yeah. And he's an attorney. Or are they both attorneys? They are, they're both they're attorneys. Both attorneys. Yeah. I don't think they do this law, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they probably or do. They, they were did, protecting they... the people that invaded them. Yeah. Yeah. But, but we anyway, talked it's... about another episode where you can uh, make your house a harder target by use of lighting, uh, security systems, cameras, things of that nature. But once they breach your property... One of the things we talked about was the the good old that sound, you know that yep. that should prevent. Is that something that still is kind of ambiguous or? Oh yeah, I mean th- that sound is 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 not, in my opinion, something that constitutes an assault. Okay, it's a warning. It's, it's yeah. you know, yeah, you might as well. Or Tom pointing a laser at the guy's chest. <laughs> yes, Jim, we don't bring everything up on that. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that. I had a great police officer that responded. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, yeah. You didn't I, do anything wrong. I mean, you can you can have those sound effects just like you know any button in the house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that guy that night didn't know if I had my kid's yeah, laser, laser pointer, pointer or, or if it was attached to a pistol. And I can't even remember myself. Yeah, it's funny. Point. That's I know, right. Memory. <laughs> guy breaking into his car over in his driveway in Green Hills. Tom gets his laser out and puts it on dude's chest, and the gun that dude just. Uh, we we did not speak the same language. That's that, very true. That, laser did yeah. so it was fine so yeah. maybe there's a new idea here maybe you put in sound systems in homes with uh, <laughs> deployment systems for sound effects like if you that. pull onto our lot right now it comes you just out wanted automatically to, you just wanted to make sure that you, we didn't leave here today without you using that sound effect well, sure, yeah. We, we uh, could, yeah of course hey, right. I, have a, I do have a serious question um, and it's one I get asked a lot because I hunt, belong to a hunting camp a lot of land so there's public roads in between some of it and with the new, you know, or I wouldn't say new rule that you can't have a loaded firearm in your car, where does that cross with a game warden? No, no, the, the, the statute that you're talking about, 3917-1307E, and it's been on the books, what, since July 2014, and it will allow you to transport even under the Wildlife Resources Act. Um I've not seen a challenge yet to that from game wardens. You know, we we did have a problem with game wardens. Of, of it lasted only a brief time, um, but it wasn't that issue. I mean, my experience has been, if you've got the loaded weapon and you've got the hunting permit, if you get the if you get the carry permit, they they run into thirteen oh seven. They can't do anything unless they can carry the burden to show you were hunting. Even if it's a long gun versus a handgun, just don't hang it out the window. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, dang it! I'm after all the road hunters right now because yeah. I can't stand you, and I will hunt you down and find you. But it is an issue, and then it's, it's come up. You know, they're like, "Well, he pulled me over, but I had my rifle and it was loaded, and but I wasn't hunting, and so that's good to know I didn't." Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of guys that hunt, and they'll you know push the round back down in the cha- in the magazine, but mm-hmm. they don't have it chambered when they run the road. 
I'm, I'm certain there's a ton of them that have it chambered. You know? <laughs> yeah, after dark with a spotlight <laughs> laying in the freaking front seat. Yeah, those. Yeah, they're just out checking the power lines. <laughs> right. Yeah, with a loaded rifle in your front yeah. seat. Give me a break. But you know, before that statute passed, I had to defend a guy. A, and this was turkey season, so I got a guy that I'm defending. He's driving a sedan because he doesn't have a truck. So he's got a four door. <laughs> He's got camo on. He's got a he's got an open uh, bolt semi auto laying in the floorboard of the back seat. He's got turkey decoys in the back seat. He's got three legal uh, shells laying in the passenger seat. The gun's completely empty. He was charged by a metro officer for illegally carrying a firearm because the ammunition was quote in the vicinity. And under Tennessee law, if the ammunition's in the vicinity, it's considered loaded, even if it, none of it's in the gun. Wow. And that was prior to the statute. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that statute's there. <laughs> okay. Good that's, Lord. What is the purpose? Why do they do it that way? They get a lot of pressure from the Sheriff's Association and the Chiefs of Police Association to help to pass laws that help the police in Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, Knoxville, somewhat Jackson and Clarksville have increased abilities to arrest people. Mm -hmm. It sort of goes back to the thugs and the gangbangers we talked about earlier. They want the ability to get those people off the street. So they they make the pitch that if there's a gun anywhere, you know, we ought to have the opportunity and and to to make the arrest and then let us exercise discretion on the road. And the problem with that is it, it doesn't work out very well. Right. Well, and the whole discretion thing is, um, I mean, that's an, an officer's entire career. It's, it used to drive me crazy when, not all attorneys, but defense attorneys would accuse us of lying. It's like, you, you understand that that's like my entire career. It's, my, it's built on my word, mm-hmm. right? And that's what, that's what a law enforcement officer's entire career is built on their word. And so we would get really bent when that was your defense. Well, you're lying. Right, because yeah. because I want to risk my entire career over your client. Yeah, the, the, you got me. Are that's, you kidding that's me? not much of a defense. <laughs> no, actually, and, and that came up in a trial, and um, John Zimmerman was the prosecutor, and John's closing argument said, he looked at the jury and he said, if you think these men are lying, turn these guys loose. And he sat down, and of course, they got 94 years. Yeah. It took them longer to eat lunch than it did to deliberate, but... <laughs> Um, you know, anyway, I, I, I think a, an education in, in this space is important. Obviously, you are you're, you're a volunteer, which is yes, right. I twenty five years. I don't get paid. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's that's pretty impressive. I mean, I know obviously you're passionate about it, but uh, you're also an expert on the topic. And you know, we we don't always have experts on the show. We have lots of people on the show but it's good to have an actual expert on the show we have a lot of opinions darn right a lot yes. of opinions and typically we're all in the same realm on the opinion side of things but um i appreciate you doing this today obviously you're familiar with this place um it was jim came up with the idea to, to do to do a remote one and and now the royal range guys have, I, mean, I was talking to them earlier they're already talking about doing this again you know so I mean, how is it not fun to come hang out at a gun range and oh, talk, I love talk guns yeah. and firearms and have a wall of firearms and all that kind of stuff? And we'd be remiss if we don't remember to, uh, remember to mention the sponsor, God-Fearing Gun Owners. You can, you can reach out to them at godfearinggunowners.com where they believe we have the pre- freedom to practice our faith because of firearms. And I think uh, John would certainly agree with that statement. Absolutely. Uh, so please go check them out. Tennessee Firearms Association, you guys, you want to give out your web address for people? Tennessee Firearms, all spelled out, dot com. And then we're, and, and increasingly, I think this is true for a lot of places, uh, organizations like ours, our website is really an information portal, you know, like a lot of websites. You yeah. know, we don't sell stuff. Well, we do. We sell shirts and hats. But you don't go to the website and have a, a blog entry and stuff like that. A lot of, it, it's it's a, a content portal. The the real activity re- seems to take place in the Facebook groups, and then, and we're in. We got two Facebook. We got a page and a Facebook group. The great group's got about nine thousand people on it. The page has got about twenty thousand. Wow! But the Facebook group, you can go there whether you're a member or not. Join the group. It is a closed group, so you got to get into it. Um, but I mean, it's 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 a just a rampant discussion, and we heavily moderate it. I mean, so we tell people, you know. 
this group is not for general 2A stuff. Don't come here and put a meme up about the Constitution's your permit because we'll, we'll delete it. Uh, it's got to be Tennessee-related. Yeah, It's got to be relevant to what's going on in Tennessee. It can be political or whatever, but it's got to be Tennessee-related. And then we don't allow people to post, you know, because of Facebook's, we don't want them to shut us down. We don't allow any post about for self, you know, wanted ammunition or firearms. We just go somewhere else. That's what you want to talk about. Do you guys take donations? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's how we raise the money to to support candidates. For the, I mean, we've had years. This is hard to believe. We've had years since 2010 where TFA, through its PAC, has put out more money politically for candidates than the NRA did in the state. Wow. And, and so that's a big issue for us is raising money. And I want to make sure our, our listeners understand <clears throat> NRA is is a national organization, mm-hmm. you know. Donate there as well. But if you want, when you live in this state, you, as you heard today, there are state specific things that affect you and your house where you live. And uh, this is a local organization that you know is looking out for your interests, for your firearms, and and that's what you go. But now. One clarification, 501c3 versus four, so that's not a tax-deductible donation. No, it's not. But it means you can go to the candidates that you are going to that's vote right. in our interest as well. We, we heavily vet the candidates, and we'll frequently s- – s- I mean, there's a lot of correlation at times. We'll support a lot of the same people the NRA does in the state, but it's very common that we'll have several that the NRA has supported – that we won't. And, and one of the reasons is the NRA has got a philosophy, particularly at state races, of if the incumbent's not likely to get defeated, we're going to support him even if he's not a good candidate on guns because we want to be friendly to whoever's in that office, even if they're against us. Hmm. And we don't do that. We call them dirt bags and do our, everything. We can do. <laughs> uh, if you want to be Stop. taken care of, it's at the local grassroots field. Yeah. Yeah, if you guys have ever heard the term tip of the spear, it's this guy right here as far as your firearms rights go in this state. John is the tip of the spear. He's very humble about it, but he's extremely knowledgeable, educated, intelligent, obviously an attorney, and lives, eats, and breathes, and sleeps firearms and firearms related. I'm sitting here quoting the TCA law, you know, I'm like having flashbacks to law class at the police academy going, oh, my God, is there an exam tomorrow? Like, oh, my God, I haven't heard that in forever. But, yeah. again. Is all is super important stuff that I think a lot of the general public doesn't know, and I, you and I both know that the it doesn't take a lot to be able to get approved to teach the carry permit class, and no. there's there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about some of that stuff that's getting relayed to carry permit holders and it's going to end up creating issues like what we talked about so i I love that you're all over it and you continue to do that stuff and that tennessee firearms is right at the i mean right out there i mean um i think it's a great organization obviously y'all aren't going anywhere anytime soon good lord willing so no and 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 unlike some organizations if you go to our website for example you can sign up you don't have to be a member any information tfa puts out We'll give it to you whether you're a member or not. Okay. So, I mean, we want you to join as a member if you support what we're doing. Yep. As opposed to having it send us $35 to get a hat and a secret handshake. Right. You know? <laughs> and and so, like, we have probably five times our membership is on our email list. Because if they get on the email list, they'll get weekly legislative updates on which bills we're tracking, which ones are good, which one's bad. Who's the snake in the grass on that on that kind of stuff, and then announcements about when they when they pass or fail. But we also put out stuff on court cases that change the interpretation of those statutes, and there's a lot of those. Yep. AG's opinions that construe the statutes, and there's a good number of those. Uh, and we've got almost all of the AG opinions going back into the mid '90s on our website. So okay, and a lot of those you can't even get off the AG's website anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, and so we've got them all. Um, so, I mean, and, and all that information is available whether you're a member or not. But obviously we encourage people to give, join, because, I mean, you all are fighting the fight. And, of course, we're living in times now like we've never seen before. I mean, I was in here a few weeks ago, and these shelves were empty, like literally empty. Like I just got that. I'm doing a – I'm teaching a CLE class for attorneys next week, and I just got some updated data from the Department of Safety and TBI. Yep. 
So safety has now told us that as of the 1st of October, we're over 700,000 permits in the state. Now, best data says there's only about 800,000 hunters, so we're really quickly catching up yeah. to wow. just the licensed you know, hunters in the state. But the permits and the permits currently are being applied for at a rate almost twice what was the average rate in 2019. So the volume of people applying is just accelerating. But the other amazing piece of data is we since 1998, TBI has tracked because we're a point of contact state, all retail sales through gun stores. And so we know from 98 until about 2007 that the average volume per year was about 300,000 a year. Guns being bought by unlicensed people at FFLs. Then we had Obama get elected. Well, that number jumps up really quickly to about a half a million in 08, 09, and it stays there until last year. Last year, it was still just right under half a million a year. They're over 700,000 for the first six months of 2020. Wow. Yeah, that's why you can't find ammo. You can't, I mean, right. it's because people are just, they've bought everything that's out there. Yeah. Well, and I mean, the, 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 a news cycle is do- dominated by politics, protests, and pandemics are going to drive people to, to want to defend themselves. You know, I mean, we, we work with a company called Haven Lock, and their residential lock sales skyrocketed back in the spring when everybody's stuck at home because mm-hmm. i mean that's your castle your home you're watching you know the courthouse burn in nashville and you're like oh my god what's happening and you know it's, so it's you know, i mean hello it's a good time for your membership to grow as well so that when people do become new gun owners they need to be educated and stay educated about what the rights are and not just oh i got my gun i'm good um no because you end up using it you're going to need to know your the laws and they're going to need to hire a good attorney named john harris i'm just saying right? <laughs> also but anyway i really appreciate you doing this today um this is a outstanding resource for you guys to go learn anything firearms related john is obviously an expert and they're happy to share that information with you please reach out to us at tips tactics and tools.com or you can reach us on facebook and twitter i'm out